Hi, this is Shelly Hoffman with another episode of Ask the Expert. And today I'm sitting here with Ken Schmidt. And Ken is our local expert on cell towers. So what Ken agreed to do for us today is answer some uh, common questions that he gets uh, asked here in the area. So Ken, can you uh, inform us of some of these answers? Yeah, absolutely. So just a little bit of background. I'm Ken Schmidt, uh, president of a company called Steel in the Air. We advise uh, landowners regarding cell tower lease related issues. So uh, we've uh, done quite a lot across all the United States. We're um, regularly quoted in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and other magazines um, and newspapers regarding cell tower related issues. So happy to be here first. Uh, the, the most common question that we get is, can you help me get a cell tower on my property? <laughs> Everybody mm -hmm. knows somebody else that has a cell tower on their property and is making $700, $1,000, $1,500 a month right. and wants one for themselves because they believe that they have the highest hill in the county. And I can tell you that I think I've talked to every person in the entire U.S. that has the highest hill <laughs> in the county. <laughs> Even though, and in some cases, multiple people that claim to have the highest hill in the same county. So the reality is, you know, right now there are about 325,000 uh, cell sites in the United States. There's approximately 200 to 250,000 cell towers within the United States. You know, you look at it and there's 8 million or something parcels. The probability that any particular site is going to be necessary for a cell tower uh, is very minimal. So, I mean, it's a 1% chance or less, you know, related to the probability. Take that into consideration. And the, the next thing is that there's about 5,000 new cell towers being deployed on an annual basis right now. So it's not a large number, and that's across the entire country. So the chance that your particular property would be one that would be, you know, interesting to a wireless carrier is very small. Secondly, you know, there are a number of factors that, that influence whether or not your site is going to be needed. If it's in a rural area, they can go to anybody. You know, if there's a tower within, uh, say, a mile in urban or suburban areas or a tower within, uh, you know, three to five miles in rural areas, they may not need your site anyway. So, uh, generally speaking, we can't help um, people find a cell tower lease for their property, and it's unlikely that they're probably going to be contacted directly. Okay. Yep. So the company, just to clarify, will the company go and find their, the people that they want as opposed to people trying to find the companies? Is that kind of how that works then? Yes. Okay. So if you've been approached for a cell tower, you know, it's not like multiple companies are going to come and ask you to put a cell tower on your property. Just because one likes it doesn't mean the others necessarily will. Okay. Conversely, if you haven't been approached, there's really no amount of marketing that you can do to have somebody come to you and put a cell tower on your property. Either they need it and they'll come find you, or they don't need it and you'll never see them or hear from them. So, no, that makes sense. Yeah. We, um, so the church here in the village has a cell tower in the steeple. So that would have been something they came most likely to the church and said, this is a good location, this is what we'd like to do. And then obviously there was a lot involved in that, but okay. Yeah, so interesting about the, uh, it's a Verizon uh, installation within the steeple. Uh, steeples generally are the least preferred location for a wireless carrier to deploy their equipment in. But there can be a number of reasons why they have to. The first being either you know, there may be historical uh, locations within the village that, can't, you know, that require environmental and uh, national uh, historic preservation review. There can be zoning limitations. Likely it would be very difficult for Verizon to have built a new tower the same height as that steeple within the village. That's right. So what ends up happening is that the steeple becomes the best of the remaining options. Gotcha. And fortunately for the church, you know, they end up getting, uh, they're gonna get you know, monthly revenue. I don't know what they're receiving, but my estimates would be somewhere in the $1,500 to $2,500 a month range for that steeple installation in their the, the cell site installation in their steeple. Okay. And, you know, relatively speaking, Verizon came in, you know, they, they structurally shore up the steeple, they put their equipment in there, church gets the revenue, nobody's really the wiser, you don't see it. If you didn't see any of the construction or whatnot, you wouldn't even know that it's there. Know it's there. Yeah. No. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So what's another common question that you get asked often? So 
One of the questions that we get frequently is whether or not these types of devices and the cell towers actually cause health risk you know, to individuals. Okay. Uh, currently, there's been a significant uptick in terms of the number of uh, people that are concerned regarding the potential health risk. And the problem is that there's a lot of bad science out there. And I'm not here to advocate one way or another whether there's risk or not. What I can suggest is that you know, major you know, American Medical Association, you know, the FCC and other organizations have found that there is no correlation between uh, cell phone use or cell tower use and uh, cancer or other um, well, uses. Yeah. There you know, there have been some high profile situations lately where, uh, for example, you know, uh, any time a cell tower goes near a school or even has already been built next to the school, you know, understandably, parents could be scared or concerned about potential health risk with their children. Uh, that's taken to a fever pitch lately in that in a number of cases they're trying to actually have the cell towers removed, even if they're already there, you know, and the parents are showing up in mass and trying to uh, threaten to pull their kids out of school if the cell tower stays. So <clears throat> fundamentally what I can tell you is, you know, without getting into the science of it or specifically where is, you know, what's dangerous, what's not dangerous. I can tell you when we've had studies actually performed by radio frequency engineers to, that the distance from a cell tower where there is an area that the radio frequency propagation or the emissions exceeds that that the FCC has allotted. You know, it's typically 10 feet, 15 feet from the actual antennas. And the antennas that go on these towers and cell sites are directional. They're big panels. You know, they're, if you picture a door, you know, up, upwards, that's what a cell tower antenna looks like. It focuses outwards, not downwards or upwards, because there's not much value in covering above, and there's not much value in shooting the radio frequency waves into the ground, so it shoots them outwards. So what ends up happening is that there's, there's certainly areas around a cell tower or a cell tower antenna that are potentially dangerous, but they're limited to 15 feet, you know, 20 feet from the actual antennas. And if the antennas are 100 feet above the ground, right. you would have to literally climb up the tower to be in an area where it would be considered dangerous. Okay. Yeah. That um that kind of makes sense. I mean, if it's if it's up high, but again, if you don't know that information and you just see some structure next to your child's school, you know that's obviously every parent's nightmares that something happens to your kid. Yeah, and it seems that lately, what's another thing that's interesting is that lately we've started to see you know influence from overseas in um, from uh, you know New York Times ran an article recently, <coughs> excuse me, that suggested that the the Russians were posting social media things stories that allege that, you know, 5G causes cancer oh. as an effort, you know, the, the purportedly as an effort to try to discourage the deployment of 5G and the robust uh, economic value that's created as a result of it uh, and to create, you know, additional communication uh, capabilities within the United States. So, you know, parents naturally see those. There are um, noted experts and some not so noted experts. <laughs> who proclaim very clearly that they think that there's a health risk and you know there's no shortage of people that are willing to step up and claim whether they have any background or not for it you know, right. that there is a potential health risk um, but within the New York Times it just said that creating that paranoia or something mm -hmm. obviously would have an effect on how we utilize the technology especially yes. as parents so that makes sense as well so is there any new trends or anything we should be on the lookout for that's coming yes so one of the things that's, that's, that, that's really been happening, it's, it's fairly new within our industry. The technology isn't necessarily new, but the deployment and installation of it is new. So historically, the cell tower has always been you know, a tall structure. It's been a 100-foot, you know, a 200-foot structure. It covers a distance of uh, you know, approximately in rural areas. It can get upwards of 25 miles. In you know, suburban areas and even urban areas, the area that they're intended to cover could be as little as one half of a mile in diameter. So these sites are fairly large. They have a lot of equipment. They're intended for a broad area. What the industry has realized is that there are pockets of areas where there are capacity issues. So your phone, you get coverage. You look at the top of your phone and it says, I have five bars. 
but right. you try to make a call or you try to download something onto your phone and it takes forever or you can't make the phone call. And that's a capacity issue. So the industry has gotten much more intelligent about where those capacity issues occur and they're capable of doing a number of things. One can be adding new macro cells or traditional cell towers. The other is that they can start, they're starting to add small cells. And so <clears throat> small cells are part of what enables 5G, the fifth generation of wireless technology. I'm going to sound kind of, mm -hmm. but what, what exactly do you mean when you say a small cell? So a small cell is a antenna that is typically placed on a utility pole or maybe a rooftop, etc. Okay. Uh, it, it's the size of a small, you know, about that big. It's not very big. Um, the equipment fits on the outside of the pole, so it's not remotely the same size as a traditional cell tower. Gotcha. And normally they're installed on utility poles, light poles, traffic signals, or other things like that. And so what the FCC has done is they've said, you know, we believe that this is an important technology. And as a result, they legislated or they created an order that basically said that municipalities cannot prohibit the placement of small cells within the public right of way. Okay. So these small cells can be placed alongside you know, your, any public street that has a right of way. The wireless service provider, in many cases, most cases, can install a new pole. So what's happening is that over the next uh, the next five to ten years, we expect to see a hundred, you know, around a million uh, new small cells being deployed across the United States. So if you reference back to what I said before, you were looking at three hundred, you know, something thousand cell sites within the United States. We're looking at you know within a ten year period, you know, uh, quadrupling that in terms of the number of small cells. So these things, we'll start seeing them. The uh, city of Syracuse is currently you know, entering into or entered into an agreement with Verizon for small cells, you know, 660 or something okay. of them within the, the city. Uh, it won't be long before we start seeing you know, a couple of small cells here and there within the city of, you know, the village of Baldwinsville, certainly Liverpool, Camillus, you know, uh, anywhere around here. So you know me, so you know I have another question yeah. when I start to smile. So yeah. is it as um, as the village of Baldwinsville grows, because we do have, mm -hmm. you know, more and more homes being built, we have the apartments um, over on Lock Street being built, is that why we need maybe a small cell? Because we have more people coming in, so more people using, or as people come in to use Paper Mill Island, you know, um, is that what you mean when you say the capacity? That's an excellent question, because it is. It's exactly the latter. It's, the, it's you know, the regular traffic that can be handled, you know, most of that can be handled by macro cells. Okay. So, you know, the capacity, you can add another macro cell in between some of the existing macro cells, and that handles the capacity issues. Okay. Paper mill is a great example, like Seneca River Days, which I just happen to be the chair of. <laughs> come and see shameless it next year. Plug. Yeah, Whatever. shameless plug. Yeah, Come and see it next year. But you know, we, this this past year we had about 2,200 people on the island at the same time. And since, like any event, you know, people want to share photos and videos yeah. and whatnot while they're out there. They want to you know demonstrate that they were there. You know, we had the the Baldwinsville uh, pet band there, so people were taking it's videos, yeah. yeah, and all that. So, but what happens is that the network, you know, that, that's trying to handle it at that time gets overloaded. It simply can't handle. So there's two ways of addressing it. The first is you bring in what's known as a cow or a colt, a cell on wheels or a cell on a light truck, you know, which basically is a way of adding temporary capacity. Okay. Or if you know the paper mill is going to be booked up, you know, six or 10 or 12 times a year, you add a small cell, you know, somewhere within the village near that to actually handle that excess capacity. Okay. It's funny how many things that clears up for me because um, if I attend an event or a conference and mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of live videos and all of a sudden the live video is a little bit mm -hmm. um, shaky whereas when there was nobody there it was a clear picture. Yeah. So again it would be that capacity that you were talking about. Well we have a great example of it coming up. We've got the state fair. Oh yeah. Yeah, You've got all of those people, I don't know how many people, a couple million I guess, you know that come over the the 15 day period. You know they're all hyper located within that area. Mm -hmm. Not only do they come to the the fairgrounds, but they're also staying in the hotels around and whatnot. And it's a fairly large influx of population, you know, into C city of Syracuse. Right. So, you know, there are pockets of demand that are created, especially at a state fair, where people, again, want to use their wireless device. So what you see, if you drive by, and one of the dangers of actually starting to hear and know more about this, is that as soon as you start looking for cell tower sites and whatnot, you can't stop. <laughs> 
see him. You see him everywhere. You see him everywhere. <laughs> you see him everywhere. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> it's a new travel game when you're traveling with your kids. Oh, yeah. Look for cell towers. Look for cell towers. <laughs> yeah. So, but you'll see like right outside the uh, the state fair, you know, across the way, they're on the bottom of the billboard. There are a number of sites that are built up on the hill, uh, up where the amphitheater parking is, so that they can see down into the state fair. Um, they'll also bring in um, the super cows, the super cell on wheels, where they have these large, it almost looks like one of the weather um, <clears throat> radar balls, except smaller. It would be about 10 feet in diameter, okay. and they put them up high. Uh, they were at the, the Syracuse Nationals, and they had these, you know, they, they put those up, and those things handle a tremendous amount of capacity, you know, at the same place. So you see an entire area. Uh, at the Syracuse Nationals, it was right near the where the sheriff um, uh, and the state police uh, demonstration area is. Okay. Yeah, so if you're there, you know, at the state fair, look again, because I suspect they'll He'll be there again. Yeah. So. Well, um, this was a lot of great information. Mm -hmm. um, I think Ken would probably give us another 15 minutes of information because it's a at least for me and most people that I'm um, familiar with, it's information that we don't always have. So um, we appreciate you taking time today to be here. If you have any additional questions, which I'm sure you probably will, you can go to our website, which is pacbtv.org. And again, PAC is spelled P-A-C, not P-A-K. Or, or visit us on Facebook, and uh, we will certainly run this uh, information, share it with other people so they can have this information as well. Um, everybody have a great day. Thank you.